Hi everyone, my name is Catrice. I am Catrice Greer. I am a poet. I am Baltimore based. I'm really a creative. I'm a poet. I'm a writer. I'm a producer. I'm an organizer. I do a lot of stuff. A narrator. But the point is, is that I'm here today with my peers to talk about mental health in the black community. And the way I'm going to do this today is I'm, I'm going to talk about stigma and the confluence of that. But the way I'm going to come about this today is I'm going to start out, read a poem, and then somewhere in between, I'm going to read you a few poems, but somewhere in between, I'll do a little talking so you can get to know me a little better and why this is important. I am a mental health awareness advocate in my area, and I partner with places like Pro Bono Counseling, and I'm active in our tra trauma-informed approach in our city, which is one of the first cities in the country to get the backing of legislators to create a full systemic program to try to deal with some of the trauma in our city. The first poem is called, This is Anecdotal. This, this is anecdotal. We hear enough about statistics. We live the facts enough to know it is true. They want us to believe it is incidental, not systemic. Our stories discredited and silenced even in the dark night of our brutal deaths, ushered by murder and neglect. It's real when they say so. It's only real when the research our communities mine us for evidence so that funding should support what we've been done told them. Until then, we are criminalized, silenced, suspicious, disregarded, discredited, left to die in cells. Please mute. Please mute, guys. Please mute, because there's feedback. Thank you. Until then, we are criminalized, silenced, suspicious, disregarded, discredited, left to die in cells on the streets, twisted into knots, and told to bear it all, hands up, mouths stitched, hanging. Our needs go unmet. Chattel is what they see. Baby birds with beaks wide open, waiting for crumbs is what they want. While we scream for dignity, speak our humanity to these derelict spirits, this melanin jealousy, sociopaths enjoying the starving. But this this testimony is incident, right? Sandra Bland, Corinne Gaines, Elijah McLean, and the list of black bodies piling up high, unloved souls, stacks and stacks. This is anecdotal though, anecdotal though, right? These black bodies, souls long gone. I wanted to start out with that poem because the names that I mentioned Sandra Bland, Corinne Gaines, Elijah McLean all had something special about them, something many of us can relate to. Sandra Bland had, she had depression, she had PTSD. She was stopped for a normal traffic stop and she was jailed and eventually murdered in her cell. But did you know that she was suffering from PTSD because she had previously lost a child and she had anxiety and depression and she was managing that. She was also an articulate black woman speaking up for herself and all too often we're dealing with, apparently I live in America, so there's a, there's a certain ideology with certain American whites that not everybody but there's a certain ideology with American white people that seem to think they know everything. And if you speak articulately, if you speak with power, if you speak with authority about what you think or question their motives or tell them you don't like something, all of a sudden that's room for death. That's room to discredit you. That's room to ruin your reputation. That's room to say you're difficult. Sandra Bland lost her life for what feminists in this country claim they stand up for until the intersection of feminism and racism meet, then all of a sudden it's a problem. 
Corinne Gaines was also a young woman who experienced, um, she, she actually lived 15 minutes from where I live. She lived in Randallstown. She was a young woman who experienced lead paint poisoning as a child, which we have a big problem with here in Maryland and I'm sure other places around the globe as well, and that affects people cognitively. So, you know, you're also going to experience various mental health symptoms and issues because cognitive impairment includes that. And she was very upset when the police came, and instead of talking things down, they killed her in front of her child. It wasn't that they lacked de-escalation techniques it was because they didn't give a damn and they did what they wanted to do and they didn't want to be bothered using de-escalation techniques because our bodies don't matter to them elijah mclean who i also mentioned in this poem was an autistic young man i am a woman that the dsm at one point called asperger's it's no longer part of the dsm so I have a diagnosis of Asperger's, but now we're just called being on the autism spectrum. Now, Elijah McLean is somebody's child. And all he was doing was minding his business. And his, his crime was that they thought he was a bit weird or a bit odd. And he didn't respond in the way they wanted him to respond. He was rather confused and really sweet and they don't like that because it doesn't fit the stereotype. So they took him down too because anything is reason to extinguish and, and, and uh, execute a black body that you don't like, that you don't want to see as humane. So our mental health gives some people their belief another reason to attack, be it bereavement, be it your mental health diagnoses, be it the fact that you're just articulate trying to be in this world, somebody has a problem with it. And in this world, unfortunately, black bodies aren't always safe. So that poem was called Accident, and this is anecdotal. The next poem I want to read to you is because I very much um, it's about Sandra Bland. It's a poem for the page. The one I just read is spoken word. And you have to forgive me because I'm very angry this morning because a friend of mine who lived here in Baltimore and he's an entertainer was in Mississippi last night and he was pulled over by the police and it was filmed and he's okay, but they really did not do him right. And so it's all over his news feed. And I'm upset because he's one of the most loving people in the world. And he's another one who's one of the sweet, sweetest black men you'll ever meet. And his crime was that to them he was weird. And he told the police officer, don't hurt me. You're hurting me. I love you. So for me, as a woman that is articulate, that is educated, I am constantly constantly having to fight every day. I don't care if I have to go and order a hamburger. There's somebody up in my face who has a problem with the fact that I speak a certain way, that I may have certain knowledge. They don't like that. You know, it, it goes without saying. You're not supposed to know only but so much, according to other people. And I can't live like that. And the fact that that happens uh, is very stressful to me. I was personally in a poetry experience uh, a number of weeks ago. Six people died in my family. I have been grieving. Two of my best friends died at the top of the pandemic last year. So count that being eight. I sat in this poetry experience or whatever it was, a place I'd like to be many weeks ago, and some people said some things I really didn't appreciate. I spoke up about it, and uh, I had come there actually to read a poem about um, sexual assault that I had written that morning and that and that weekend because I was receiving a whole lot of uh, sexually harassing inbox messages that I didn't want. But see, as a black woman, you're not supposed to not like that. You're supposed to be hypersexual and that's supposed to be okay with you. And God forbid if you say you don't like it. 
So in that, that poetry engagement, you know, when I spoke up and said, hey, look, I was already dealing with my own triggers from the weekend because I'm a sexual assault survivor, a rape survivor, a molestation survivor. I got to deal with shit every day of my life. Not to mention claim my space as a woman of authority and a woman with, with talents and skills. And God forbid if you put me in charge of something. Because then somebody doesn't want to listen to what I'm saying to them. And I got to deal with back talk every time somebody I open my mouth to give an instruction. So just to be clear, I very much identified with Sandra Bland. And so the poem I want to read to you is very small, and it's called Buried Seeds. Pressed too hard in the clamor of light and day, there is too much to say. All the words swallowed hard, thumb pushed into soil piled spaces. Left to lie still, germinate if it can survive the neglect the cold, the grains rubbing the husk of it. Yet some send roots to root, calls its network, call, ties, tethers, stores, wellsprings of birthing water, trumpets to the sun. These entombed kernels, powerful, germinate, refuse to be silent, refuse to be left unnourished, refuse to be piled on, muted, and all the buried seeds crack open in the dark. Ready, embryonic, emergent. I have one last poem to read and then I'm done. And uh, like I said, the other thing is that Black women don't often, and I'm speaking from this point of view, black art women don't often get to express their rage in a safe way, and neither do black men or people of color in general, because then that is, that is seen as criminality. Because first of all, you're not in your place. Who do you think you are saying things with authority or, or claiming your own autonomy to speak your feelings? And so therefore, unfortunately, we stuff that down and hold that in. And then what happens? We have problems at home because it's stuffed down and pulled in. Or we are distant and dissociated because it's stuffed down and pulled in. And people are not listening to these voices. And we're in a time in history where that just won't do. We're in a time in history again because, just to be clear, it, this repeats generationally of people emerging, raising their voices because we get sick from holding in what we cannot say. It does something to your body. I won't even repeat my health conditions. I really, really respect, uh, and I don't know if I'm saying her name correctly, but Warimu, um, because I have some of her conditions, and she's absolutely right. The words have to come out. They have to be said, because it becomes poison on the inside of you. And we have a problem, because if you speak, sometimes it is a problem to some other people. They see you as problematic. And then if you go to a therapist, you have to make sure you select the right therapist for you, because there are plenty of therapists who... In my in my experience, I had I studied to become. I won't even go there. I you know some of us know science. Let's just put it that way. And uh, <laughs> we know science because we studied it. And some of us are just doggone brilliant, and you ain't studied nothing. You just know because you're very smart. And I've had therapists tell me in my face, "Well, you're very intelligent. How do you know these things? Maybe you could heal yourself." So you're dealing with implicit bias even within the ther the constructs of therapy. You now have to find the people that are right for you. This is not easy. This is a minefield. So for me, it may be a little bit easier for me as a, a black woman who's used to research, who's used to academia, but that does not mean it's easier. I still have to step over the landmines just like everybody else, and so do you. And as far as I'm concerned, we're in this together. And I still say that therapy is important because it it's right when you get the right people. The last thing I'm going to read is a poem of just basic rage. I'm not going to lie to you. And um, it's called I Am Speaking. And then I will end um, and respectfully listen to everyone else. When I speak, I am speaking out of a black mouth. 
I am speaking out of the black face that has the black mouth with the black lips. When I speak, I am speaking out of the black body, the black face with the black liberated mouth without needing anyone's permission that has the black lips that speak about the black things. I am speaking from the black vagina that gives me my black mate's pleasure and the black womb a portal of life, a galaxy of DNA from where we birth black babies that live vibrant black lives. I am speaking from the bottomless well of my generations before me, where my melanin-rich skin was treated as burden and division, when in fact it is protection, it is gold, it is wealth. I am speaking from the PTSD, the marks what you do in the dark to us every day, behind your closed lip, dry smiles that beget your generational bloodlust you ignore. I am speaking from trauma, the OCD they call irrational, that is only trying to remember to count in the rituals we forgot. Remember the memories we lost. Remember to create triangles and threes of our sacred geometry. It tells me to speak in math and mysteries of the Library of Alexandria, nestled in the papyrus of my DNA before warring Greek marauders burned it all down. Remember that sacred lives here. I am speaking the Dogon peoples, the shaman, the visionaries. Remember that the sacred live here. Remember that the sacred are born here. Remember the sacred life we give. Remember nothing can erase majesty. It's in the blood. We cannot be erased. It's in the blood. Thank you. Just wow. Just wow. Hey, Ro Rohan. Yes, my brother. Um, if, if I could say something real quick. Please. Um, please. Catrice, I'm in Baltimore as well. Uh, please uh, follow me on Instagram so we can get together. Um, mental health. Uh, awareness and the fight against mental health is a battle that I want to fight as well. Okay. Uh, the poet that has that spoken. 